Welcome back to Practice Update. I'm Dr. Farzana Hafizula. Joining me today is Dr. Eric Janash. Dr. Janash is a professor in the Department of Genitourinary Medical Oncology in the Division of Cancer Medicine and Director of the BHL Clinical Center at the MD Anderson Cancer Center. Wonderful to have you here again. Thanks. It's really nice to be here. So with the recent approval of cabozantinib in the frontline setting and potential approval of various IO combination therapies in the near future, how will you decide on which agents to use? Really interesting question, um, and this kind of really comes down to a, what strategy do we use in the frontline setting? Um, we're going to have uh, ipilimumab and nivolumab approved in the frontline setting. We're also going to potentially have atezolizumab and bevacizumab in the frontline setting. We have sunitinib and pazopinib, and we also have cabozantinib. So, how do we actually integrate this into a frontline strategy? The overall survival data and also the complete response data that we saw with ipilimumab and nivolumab is actually pretty impressive. And so that IO combination is probably going to be something that we're going to be using a lot for patients with intermediate and poor risk features. Capazantinib was shown to be beneficial in individuals with intermediate and poor risk features as well as compared to sunitinib. I think the big question will be there, those two drugs or combination versus drug are sort of vying for that, that um, intermediate to poor risk space. In which patients would we not use ipilimumab and nivolumab or we use cabozantinib instead? And it could be in individuals, for example, who have bone metastases, who have high burden of disease where you can't really get it wrong and you have to have a high probability of getting some degree of shrinkage. Because the ipilimumab and nivolumab combination, we still have PD as best response in about 28% of patients. So if you need a guaranteed shrinkage and response, cabozantinib might be useful. Excellent. Now, in the good risk group of patients, uh, the question there is, do we still use a drug like sunitinib or pazopinib, or do we use atezolizumab and bevacizumab, which if you look at the, um, the, the forest plots, seem to be beneficial in that group of individuals as well. And that's, I think, a little bit less clear um, to the um, benefit of, of atezolizumab and bevacizumab is that's very well tolerated. There is a complete response rate, which is, uh, which is above 10% based on, on, on the data that uh, were presented at this, at this meeting, but um, it's expensive, and um, maybe then you're going to be sort of using up your, your, your IO opportunities in that group. So I think that's going to be a little bit more controversial, and we're going to have to figure out what to do in that good risk population of patients. Excellent. So more information on that front, and um, it'll be an individualized decision. Yeah, and it's no question that these are exciting times, and this is a, a, uh, a situation that we could have only dreamed of a few years ago. Fantastic. Well, again, moving closer to a cure. Absolutely. And to our viewers, thank you again for joining us. I'm here with Dr. Eric Janosch on Practice Update. Please join us again soon.